Okay, Steve. The Word of God is alive and powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. There's a divided asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and the critic of the thoughts and tips of the heart. All Scripture is God-breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. We always say it's a spiritual spin stuff right here because we really care for you. Go ahead and pray for us, Steve. Father, again, we thank you for the privilege, the freedom, and the opportunity to rightly divide your word study tonight. So we ask your blessing of Dr. Jim as he brings it to us and we learn more that will uh, strengthen our walk in the Christian way of life. These things we ask in Jesus' name, man. In his name we pray. Amen. Just in case you need it, Today's subject is Acts 17, Part 4, but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's just as easy as that. Let's take a look at our notes uh, and just do a bit of review. This is Acts chapter 17, verse four, uh, Part 4, which implies that we've had uh, three, hour, uh, three sessions prior to this. That would be a total of about, um, about three and a half hours or so. Going back to verse 18, between verse 18 and 24. We're going to start in 25 today, but here's what we saw that would have been last, uh, would have been yesterday. In verse 18, Paul is slandered by the philosophers in Athens. Do you recall what, what, it, what they called him? They called him a what begins with a B? They called him a babbler. We indicated that word babbler uh, sometime before Paul came on the scene, I think it was about 100 years before he came on the scene, that word was used, <coughs> excuse me, that word was used with inconsequential birds who would go about the, uh, the marketplace as a scavenger, picking, picking uh, uh, food out of, the, out of the marketplace. But by the time Paul came on the scene, that word had changed his meaning. So it was no longer a bird that was a babbler, but it was actually a person. So they transferred that, that meaning from a bird to a person. And a babbler was, could be illustrated by a bird. you got the bird going through the marketplace, picking here, picking there, picking there, picking there, and he's picking food. But the marketplace was a place where people assembled, you just have a good time, go down, sit around, talk, or whatever. And... The babbler was someone who, in the marketplace, deemed himself to be an intellectual. But rather than be an intellectual, he wasn't very smart at all and proved that because when he went around, after he picked up all these bits of information here and here and there, he walked around the marketplace uh, presenting himself as some really intelligent kind of a guy. And oftentimes didn't even make any sense. So they transfer, these philosophers called Paul a babbler, basically because they did not understand what he was saying. Now remember, this is a city where, where temples are absolutely rampant. One on every street corner, perhaps. Just, just hundreds and hundreds of, of, these, of these temples. And uh, in verse 18, one group says that Paul was a babbler, but there was another group in there that actually said, he was proclaiming strange deities. They didn't understand what he was. Well, in verse 19, that should be, I, I think I've got an FP here. It should be, Paul is forcefully taken to the Supreme Court, and I said that quote-unquote there, that's the high court, and it was on Mars Hill. And Mars Hill was a special hill in Athens, and it's noted for several things. We'll see that in just a minute. But what happened when they took Paul to the Supreme Court, to this court, he's facing a judge. And the judge asked him a question. And he said, what is this new teaching that you're proclaiming? Well, in verse 20, there's, the judge goes on and makes another statement. And he says, we want to know what these, what these things mean. And when he says, I want to know what these things mean, actually what he's talking about is Paul's message as he's preaching Jesus and the resurrection. They got no clue about this. Well, in verse 21, we went on from there, and the, Athen the Athenians and foreigners in town. And we saw that those foreigners 
were actually people who came from all over the known world at that point in time because of the philosophers in Athens, the artwork in Athens, all these statues of idols in Athens, and it was an art center. So they would come and they would they would come in sort of like a vacation, I guess, and they would come over there and sit under the feet of these philosophers and look around the city. And these are the foreigners that were in town. And it says the Athenians and foreigners in town, all they do is waste time. Why? They're sitting around listening to something new or hearing something new. So it would be sort of like, I, as I was preparing this again, the thought that went through my mind, how many times have we gone into a situation, a circumstance where a bunch of people around say, hey, friend, what's new? What's new? See, these people are sitting around looking for something new. They want to hear something new. They want to take that and uh, pass it on. This is what they are saying over there. So someone said, uh, what's new, friend? Well, this is what they're saying over there. That's the kind of thing that was going on in this marketplace among these foreigners and the Athenians. Now, I, have, I had a Navy term. I threw a Navy term, and they called it scuttlebutt. And it just, it just information is just meaningless, okay? In verse 22, Paul makes a critical observation. And he says, men of Athens, in every respect, you are very, very religious. You're very religious. But the truth of the matter is, is that Paul is using that word religion in a very, very negative way. And I want us to understand Sometimes as we grow in our understanding of the Word of God, we find that there are terms that we use that may not be correct, they may not be, they may not be accurate, and we have habituated that terminology, and it's just like it just flows out of the mouth. You can get ready to say something, boom, there, you pop it out there. So what we have to do is be aware of the fact that some terms that we're using are very damaging if it's not understood. Because if you go outside this house now and talk to people about religion, if you on Facebook, you're talking to somebody about religion, as long as you're not talking about some Far Eastern religion, something like that, that you may be talking about Christianity as a religion. And they see that as very, very positive. But the truth of the matter is we have to understand that the term religion is a bad term. It represents something that is evil. And so we find here then in, um, in verse 22, where Paul is actually telling these people, uh, you know, the source of every form of religion is the devil itself. I, that's, my, that's my comment. Every, and here's the issue. Every form of religion, mark it down, every form of religion is evil. What that means, it is a distortion of truth. Christianity is not a religion. It is a spiritual way of life that begins by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. At that point in time, you become a spiritual individual. The entire Christian life is a spiritual way of life. It is not a religion. Religion is man by man's efforts trying to please God. Well, God's provided for us. It's not a matter of us, us having to manufacture anything. So Paul says, you're, you're, you're very, very religious. And when he says that, he's connoting something that's not good. In verse 23, Paul's next statement then, we said, is a masterful kind of statement. Because here's the issue. You've got all these, all these um, uh, idols, temples, statues all over town. And every one of them representing a false god. And many, many of these people that are there are worshiping at the feet of these, their idol, whatever it happens to be. But as Paul is looking around... Paul sees all these idols, but one catches his attention, and that is the that is the uh, the altar with the inscription to an unknown god. Now I don't know how long it's going to take for me to communicate this clearly, for you actually to catch what Paul is doing here. This is absolutely masterful, and here's why: he is preaching about a god that they don't understand. Jesus, Jesus is the Son of God. The Father is God. The Son is God. The Holy Spirit's God. And so Paul is preaching about a God about which they do not know. They can tell you about this one. They can tell you about that one. They can tell you about. But all of a sudden, here's this. Here's this one other. It's uh, the the uh, the altar to the unknown God. And he says, "Wow, hold it just a second. Here's my opportunity." 
this altar is, it's, it's not, it doesn't represent Jesus. It's, that's not what it was there for, but it, it illustrates what, what's happening there. They don't know who he is. So I'm telling you, I'm preaching about the one right over here that you don't know anything about. Okay? Does that make, do, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, if you don't, just say so. But I want you to see that. This, so when he, when he picks up on this, this is a masterful plan. It's a masterful idea. You don't know who I'm, you're calling me a babbler. You say, I'm out here preaching about strange deities. Well, look here, you got this, this altar over here? This is the one that I'm preaching about, okay? So he calls it, it's called the, uh, the, uh, the altar of the unknown God. Now, this idol, he says, this idol, and he's telling these people this. He says, this idol, the one to the unknown God, he says, this idol, whom ye, being ignorant, worship. You got people worshiping this thing. You don't even know who he is. Well, I'm going to tell you who this guy is. So in verse 24, Paul uses a new teaching approach. He's going to approach this in another way. Now, get this. Up until this time, Paul has been preaching the, the, the Christ is the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died, buried, resurrected, and he's been preaching that. But now he's going to step away from that, and he's going to talk about something else. And when, when, we, when we realize what he's saying here, I felt like there's several things about this that when you just read it, it won't make any sense. You just, it's just a bunch of words. But when you, when you dig down and, and get the meaning behind all that he's saying, all of a sudden it just comes alive. So let's watch this. Paul's going to use a new approach here. New teaching approach. In verse 27, 24, rather, here's what he says. The, the God, now we know that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, but he's speaking specifically here about the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, the God, a reference to Jesus Christ, who made the world and all things in it. Now, you remember, and yesterday we went to Colossians chapter 1, and we saw that God the Father, in his plan for the human race to resolve the angelic conflict, appointed Jesus Christ to be the creator of all things. So when, when the angelic conflict is beginning, Jesus then is going to create the earth. He's going to create everything in it. He's going to cre be, be a part of the creation of man. And we saw in that Colossians 1, 1 passage that where Jesus is actually the creator of all things, and all things were made by him and for him, okay? So, in verse 24, the God, a reference to Jesus Christ who made the world and all things in it, since he, Jesus, is the Lord of heaven and earth, he, Jesus, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So they're worshiping this thing. It's called an unknown God. And he's telling them, you're worshiping that thing, and I'm preaching to this guy, but he's not a part of that temple right there. Paul now continues. We're picking up brand new tonight, fresh. Paul continues his new approach. That means he's no longer talking about Jesus died, buried, resurrected. He's talking about Jesus, who is actually the creator of all things. In verse 25, he continues and says, nor is he the resurrected Christ, nor is he served by human hands. Now, hold on for that. You see, uh, he's served by human hands. So you've got this God that's related to this, uh, to this, uh, this idol, this altar, and it's just as though the God is sitting there waiting for you to come along and do something for him. And he says here, nor is he served, nor is that he served by human hands. That's what you do with the altar. But you don't serve Jesus Christ. You don't serve him by human hands. As though he, the resurrected Christ, needed anything. Since he, the resurrected Christ, he himself gives to all people life, breath, and all things. So he's, he's pointing out that the one that you're sort of referencing over here with this unknown, uh, unknown God at this altar, you don't know who he is. I'm preaching him, uh, him. You think that you have to do something to serve that idol to make it happy, but I'm telling you, it is he, Jesus I'm preaching, is the one that's going to make you happy. That's the idea. 
So let's look at some of the phrases here. He says, nor is he served by human hands. That phrase, served by human hands, what Paul is saying here, that great artists and great sculptors of Athens are not able to design a body and say that that body is God. You can sculpt all day long. You can paint paintings all day long. But that is not a God. Not at all. The application here then is simply this. Heathenism assumes that for the gods to be happy, listen, and just think it through. This not just to be a statement. Here you've got this altar over here. And heathenism assumed that, that for the gods to be happy, the gods needed offerings and sacrifices provided by the heathen. You, fo you follow that? See, that's, that's the idea of this thing. And that's what they've been doing. Now, here's the wrong conclusion. Heathenism concludes that man is necessary to make the gods happy. Stop right there. Listen to that. Just see what that says. That's not just an idle statement. That's what was happening in this area. This was the mindset of the people to where, where Paul has gone. And by quite, quite honestly, if you were a missionary and God called you to certain, certain areas of the world, you'd find that same thing still existing today. So these heathen conclude that man is necessary to make the gods happy rather than God being necessary to make man happy. See, it's just reversed, 180 out. Now, Paul recognizes the Athenians' failure. In verse 25, we're going to talk about some things in that, in that verse. It says, as though he needed anything. He is Jesus, as though Jesus needed anything. These Athenian philosophers assume that God, like man, has needs. Stop and think about it. They're saying that God, like man, has needs. Well, what needs do you have? You need clothes, you need water, you need food, you need transportation, you need this, you need that. So they're assuming, that, hey, if this is what we need, the gods need that too, so why don't we make the gods happy and bring these offerings to them? The next phrase is, uh, it says, all, as, all, as though he needed anything, since he, Jesus Christ, gives himself, himself gives to all people. So you think you need to feed the, the idol, God is going to give you something. He, it's just the reverse of that. Since he, Jesus Christ himself, gives to all people. God, in principle, God doesn't need anything from man. Man needs everything from God. Stop right there. This is, this is a principle that we have, to, we have to, uh, to come to grips with. So here it is. You find yourself in a particular situation. You're doing the right thing in the right way, but you find yourself in a situation where you have a need. Well, you don't go to the altar and give the, give the God something. No, what you need to believe is that God is going to provide for you what you need for that circumstance. I saw somebody the other day where they said, um, the, the question was, does God answer prayer? And uh, some of the responses, or well, one of the responses, or immediately, yes, yeah, he answers prayer. But my thought when I saw that, Marshall, was yes, God does answer prayer, but if you don't understand what that means, you may think, I'm praying, God is going to give me what I'm praying for. But the truth of the matter is, while God answers prayer, he answers it one of three ways. Do you remember what it is? Y, N, and W, A. What is it? Yes, no, or wait a while. That doesn't mean, he says wait a while doesn't mean he's going to answer it. And if, if he says no, that doesn't mean he didn't answer it. He answered it and said no. So here's the issue. God doesn't need anything from you or me. Doesn't need anything from man. Man needs everything from God. And we need to realize that at the point of, at the point of salvation, God equipped you completely for the Christian way of life by providing 51 things for you at the moment of salvation. Tragically, most Christians don't have no... Ten of what they gave him. Verse 25 also said, he gives life and breath. What does that mean? Jesus Christ gives life and breath. So we don't need any, he doesn't need anything from us. He gives everything we need. 
and he, he is the he is the creator, the giver of life and breath. And what that means is God gives life to the soul. My mind's going back to Genesis chapter two, verse seven. We'll talk about that later. Well, here it is right here. Here it is. He gives he gives life and breath to the soul. These things that I'm about to say here are are things that every believer needs to understand. If you understand, if you believe it and you understand this, then it's going to help you it's going to help you in your witness out here in the public square when you are dealing with people who don't have a clue about what life is all about. Especially especially when they tell you that I don't understand why this is happening. We're all created in the image of God. That's a starter. That is false. That is false. So what we need to see here is in Genesis 2, 7, it says, then the Lord God, that's Jesus Christ, then the Lord God formed, and that word formed means molded, molded man of the, of the dust from the ground. Now stop and, stop and picture this. There is no man anywhere. Mankind doesn't even exist. All we have is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and innumerable angels. And one-third of those angels have already rebelled against God. Satan has already rebelled. Two, a third of the angels went with him. God said, I can't, ha I can't have this. So God condemned Satan and all of these fallen angels. The wisest, most beautiful creature that ever came from the hand of God looked at him and said, excuse me, you're condemning me to the lake of fire, and I haven't had a chance to say anything yet. In other words, he's, he's, human history is the appeal phase of Satan's trial. And if you haven't heard that out there on Facebook, if you haven't heard that yet, you need to realize that human history is about something. Remember, the, remember that the uh, the Epicureans, they thought you became happy by, by pleasure, some form of pleasure. And the Stoics said, oh, no, no, it's not pleasure. It's what we think in our mind. That's fine, but neither one of them had the truth. Okay? So here's the issue. Jesus Christ is creating man. He created angels. He created the fish. He created the stars. He created the moon. He created man. One man, one man, get this, Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God, Jesus Christ, formed, he molded man of the dust of the ground. And you can just picture, he just comes down, scoops up some, some dirt here. But it's more than that, just a second. He's taking the dust of the ground, and he's going to fashion a man. So there he is, he's got, got eyes, he's got ears, he's got nose, two nostrils. He's got hands, he's got fingers, he's got feet, he's got legs. He's got the whole nine yards. And he's made that man, molded him out of, out of the dirt of the ground. And it says, and he breathed into his nostrils. Breathe means blue. He went, <laughs> he blew into his nostrils. Because here are these two nostrils, and he's, he's laying there. There's no life there. So Jesus goes, <laughs> And he blows into, into this molded man here. He blew into it. Watch what it says. It says he blew in his nostrils the breath of life. You see that? That's wrong. That's not what it says. It's what it says, but it's wrong. It's because that word life is plural. So Jesus breathed into this dirt molded man. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. He's not dead. He just had no life. So when he goes, and I like the idea, how many nostrils do you have? Two. Yep. One on one side, one on the other. And a mentor of mine made the comment that when he blew in his nostrils, he blew life up in one and blew another life in the other one. But you need to understand that the idea here is that he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life. He's, he's there. There's nothing there. He's just a bunch of dirt. 
But now what happens when he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, one life was soul life. He came alive. But at the same time, he breathed into him the breath of spiritual life. So this hunk of dirt down here, molded in the fashion of a man, now is a living soul because Jesus Christ breathed into him the, the breath of life. He gave him, he gave him uh, physical life, and he gave him spiritual life. Now, with that in mind, let's look at several points. Well, no, let's move on. It says, and man then, and man, that man is Adam, okay? And Adam became a living being. He became a living soul. See, your soul is the thing that makes you alive. That's the real you. The, your real, the real you is your soul. And your soul is going to live forever. It's either going to live in heaven or it's going to live in the lake of fire. And it's a matter of choice. And the choice is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you are guaranteed that when you die, you'll live forever in heaven. The third heaven, okay? Okay. Now, let's take a look at this because I've got several points here to help us to understand what took place in that verse. First of all, Jesus Christ molded man. It was not the Father. It was not the Holy Spirit. It was the Father's plan that Jesus did that. See, Jesus is the executor of the plan. So Jesus molded the man, and the man was molded from what? From the dust of the ground. Now, here's what happens. In the earth, in, in the dirt of the soil, there are chemicals there. And that's the real makeup of man. It's the chemicals in the soil that makes us what we are. Then in point three, it says the word for ground. Now watch this. The Hebrew word for ground, look at it. I bet you can pronounce it. What is it? Adama. What's it look like? What's that word look like? It, what's that? No, and that's, no, that's, that's the way it was perfect. What's it look like? What does the word look like? Adam. See, that's what he, but the word, the word Adam, Adama actually means red dirt. Okay? So the word, the word for ground is Adama, meaning red dirt. The word, point four, the word for, that, that word is not breath, that's breathe. The word for breathe is not pak, and that means blue, blow. So what happened, he breathed into his nostrils. He blew into his nostrils, and then the next point five, he blew into the breath, the, and the, the breath of lives, and the word breath there is nashama. And then in point six, the word for life is hayim, and, and now look, at, look at that word, hayim, H-A-Y-Y-I-M. Do you know what makes that Hebrew word plural? The last two letters, I am. The, the two letters, I am, on a Hebrew word is the same as putting an S on one of our words. That, means, that makes it plural. So it's not life, it is lives. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of lives. And point seven, the first, the first man's name was what? Adam. Adam, which is Adama, which is, means red earth, okay? Now, point eight, Adam was created. Now, notice, Adam was created as a what kind of a being? Trichotomous. As a trichotomous being. And what that means is Adam had a human body, he had a human soul, and he had a human spirit. Now, stop and look at this. Please, learn this if you don't already know it. He was given a human body. And what, does the human, what is the function of the human body? The same thing for you. What is the value of your human body? Now, you may give me 15 other reasons, and they'd be all right, possibly. But we need to understand that the value of the human body in this spiritual battle called the angelic conflict, in this invisible battle, the, the human body provides you contact with the what? The outside, world. the outside world. That means the world outside of you. You can see it. You can smell it, you can touch it, you can feel it. So the human body provides contact for the outside world. Human soul does what? The human soul gives you contact with yourself. Human spirit provides you contact with what? With the spiritual world. Now stop and think with me. 
The human body gives you contact with what's out here. The human soul gives you contact with this. And the human spirit gives you contact with that. Now, if you take a look at those three parts there, body, soul, and spirit. When, when Adam and Eve sinned, what part of them, what part of them left them? Human spirit. The human spirit. So that now all they have is a body and a soul that gives them contact with what's out here. And guess what? From the time they were outside the garden and they have lost their human spirit, they have no relationship with God, they have no fellowship with God, and guess what? They've got to solve the problems of a fallen world with what's up here without any doctrine at all. And that's exactly what's happening today. That's exactly what happened in Athens. That's what these, these philosophers, the Epicureans, the Stoics, that was their problem. They were trying to, they were trying to solve the issues of life, uh, find happiness, but they're finding, the wrong, uh, finding it in the wrong area. Now, here's a principle then that comes out of this. Principle one, man doesn't give to God on an altar. God gives to man. Second principle, no person can be happy apart from a relationship with God. It has to start there. Now, remember, when you say, well, no person can be happy apart from a relationship with God. Someone said, wait a minute, I'm happy. Yes, but see, there are three different kinds of happiness in the Bible. There's minus H, we call it minus H, neutral H, and plus H. So if you wrote that down, what you would do is put a minus sign and a, and a capital H. Then secondly, you just put a capital H. Then thirdly, you would put a plus sign and an H beside that. That, that signifies three different kinds of happinesses that the Bible talks about. The minus happiness, negative happiness, is the happiness that you have today that is fleeting. For example, you go fishing. I'm going fishing, and you go out and catch a 100-pound foot fish. You are as happy as a lark. But while you're scaling, you cut your finger. Now you just lost your happiness. See, in other words, minus H is it's transient. It's happiness for the moment, but it fleets. It, it goes away, okay? Neutral H is the kind of happiness that comes from living according to the five divine institutions. You're, you're functioning in freedom, functioning in marriage, functioning in family, functioning in nationalism, and functioning in employment. These give you happiness. But it's not the kind of happiness God wants you to have. The kind of happiness he wants you to have is the plus age, and that is when you're doing the right thing in the right way as a born-again Christian. So no person can be happy apart from a relationship with God. So you can't be happy as a, you can't have plus age as an unbeliever. You have to have a relationship with God, and that plus age begins the moment you get saved. Now, moving on in verse 26, Paul continues, and in his, it, what he, it continues, what do you do? He started in verse 24 with a new approach. 25, he continued it. He adds to that new approach right here in verse 26. And what we're going to find out is Paul continues, and nations have boundaries. Stop right there. Stop right there. Nations have boundaries. Do you see any kind of a any kind of an application here today? <laughs> wow. Any kind of an application here today. Now what happens when you know that this is the case, you understand, you realize, for example, you should know by now if you are if you're watching something other than CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, if you're watching anything other than that, if you're watching OAN, for example, if you're watching Fox News, you're going to get the truth the larger portion of the time. You're watching these other, other, um, other media sources, all you're getting is lies and deception. Now, here's the issue. The de there's not a Democrat running for, Congress, uh, running for uh, president today. There's 20 of them. 
Not one of them will tell you that we need borders in the United States of America. They will tell you that we don't need borders in nations. You better, Christian, you better understand this verse. You better understand it. Here's what it says. And he, Christ, made from one man, Adam, he made, it all started with Adam, he made from one man, Adam, every nation, and when you're talking about nations, nations sounds like nationalism, doesn't it? That's divine institution number four. And when you're talking about divine institution number four, which is nationalism, you have to understand about how a nation should be operating, and it operates on freedom. It operates on free market capitalism. Yes, it does. So here we go. It says, and he, Christ, made from one man every nation, divine institution number four, nationalism, every nation of mankind. Let me, see, let me read again. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to do what? He gave every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. So he gave nations to mankind to live on the earth. Now, do you understand how deep is this? You can't have a nation if you don't have borders. Is that clear? You can't have a nation if you don't have borders. Now, I don't care how, how much you don't like Donald Trump, you don't like the Republicans, you don't like the conservatives, you don't like the evangelicals, get it right. Get it right, you're part of the problem. God is telling us here, Jesus Christ made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. Then he goes on to say, having determined, and what he's going to do, he's going to tell us two things that God determined. Having determined two things, their, their appointed times. What did he do? He determined, he determined that man would live on the face of the earth. And he determined their appointed times. What is he talking about? He appointed the ages, the appointed times, the ages. And you know what he means by that? He appointed the age of the Gentiles, the age of Israel, the body of Christ, and the millennial kingdom. He appointed the ages. He appointed times. That word times is a reference to the ages. So he determined their appointed times and... Secondly, the national, the boundaries of their habitation. Excuse me, do you see that? He appointed the boundaries, whoa, he appointed the boundaries of their habitation. The boundaries of the nation in which you live. Let's just close here and go home yeah. in case we use... Talk so much more now we forget that. Politicians yeah. Wow. He, Jesus, made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the national and the boundaries of their habitation. Excuse me. Hmm. Here's a point of doctrine. A point of doctrine. Adam was the, what's the next word? Oh. Only. He is the only member of the human race who was totally created by God. The only member of the human race that was created by God. Now, see, now, do you understand? Do you understand that? Now, if that's the case, if that's the case, if he only created one person, how the rest of us get here? Born physically. Born physically. Procreation. See, he created Adam. We are procreated. Now, there's something interesting here. It's something I've taught in the past. See, Adam was created by God, but Eve was manufactured. She was manufactured from the rib of Adam. But only Adam was created in the image of God. Other members, all other members of the human race, are born in the image of fallen Adam. So when you hear these people that are talking about, well, you know, we've all been created in the image of God. We've all, and what they're going to, what they're telling you is this: no matter what kind of a rascal this guy is, no matter what kind of a rat this person is, rat think person is, well, they've been created in the image of God, so I guess we ought to treat them. Or an immigrant from yeah. the, uh, 
Yeah. Or they're a child of God. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's right. But and, and we're not, listen, we're not making light of this. Nope. This is the angelic conflict. You have to understand. It sometimes it it you know can you imagine can you imagine for example if you walked into Congress right now in Washington D.C. and you gave them that passage of scripture and explained it to them what kind of re, what kind of well it, are they going to respond or react they're going to react they're going to react and you will be out of there now watch this he says. Let, we're going to pull this apart again. The phrase all nations, let's go back up there just a moment again. It said, uh, and, and Jesus Christ made man, one, made from one man every nation. And we're looking at that, all nations. The world is divided in nations under three concepts. Nations are either racially divided, they're geographically divided, or they're linguistically linguistically. Uh, divided. In other words, you got a you got a uh, you got a racially divided nation. You got a geographic location here for a nation, and over here the language that they speak. Now the phrase "all nations" implies association with divine institution number four. All nations relates to this idea of nationalism. National. And what what about nationalism? Listen to me, please. Nationalism guarantees that the human race will continue to exist upon planet Earth and guarantees that in every generation the human race will be evangelized. Stop and think for just a minute. Nationalism. Understanding. This is a nation. It has borders. Now, do you understand that if the, if the, if the borders are taken away, now you have all this influx of people coming in, and you're you're getting ready to go out on the street and preach Jesus, but you've got somebody come from down there that believes that it eh, no that yes that's wrong. We're up here we're up here we're going to tell you about our God. We don't like the fact that you're talking about that. We're going to preach our God. Stop doing that. I'm not going to. Eh. So without a without a without a Without borders, if you don't have a nation with borders, what you have then is internationalism. We're going to talk about that in a second. So nationalism, the very fact that we have borders, we are functioning, we functioned in the United States of America for years and years and years, according to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution provided for mankind, and please don't talk to me about all the uh, all that man has done wrong. I understand that. Get a get a grip on your life and understand the concept of the old man and the new man functioning in the sphere of the flesh. Understand that. So if whites hate blacks and blacks hate whites and we don't like Presbyterians and we don't like Catholics, guess what? That's the old man. That's the old man. So nationalism is important to us. And what it's going to do, nationalism has those five divine institutions. Do you realize, Steve, that if you don't have freedom, you're not going to go to that racetrack next week and preach Jesus. You're not going to do it. Renee, you're not going to go to work and talk to somebody about Jesus. You're going to get fired. If you decide you're going to go to college, you won't be talking about the Bible in class. You're going to be talking about something else. You send your school, you send your child off to school. You're not going to get an education. You're going to get brainwashed. So all nations implies association with divine institution number four. Nationalism guarantees that human race will continue to exist. Yes, it will. Upon the earth and guarantees that in every generation the human race will be evangelized. You can't evangelize without freedom. So here's the principle. Nationalism makes it possible for the human race to be evangelized. Internationalism, no borders, just one big world, one world government. You got that? Internationalism destroys the possibility of evangelizing the human race. The phrase to dwell means to dwell according to the, to the norm and standard of 
five divine institutions. Now stop right there. I just read a, I just read a phrase. And already, because of their verbosity, we probably forget what was said up above. So let's go up there and look at this for just a minute again. Verse 26, and he made from one man, Adam, he made every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. The phrase that we're looking at here now is to dwell, to dwell on the earth. That word dwell actually is, means to dwell according to a norm and standard. And the Norman standard is of the five divine institutions. So God ordained nations to actually exist and function under the five divine institutions. Get that picture, please. You say, well, okay, uh, look, at, uh, look at China. Uh, look at uh, Bangladesh. Look at Cameroon. Look at Russia. Look at Bolivia. And you can look at all these nations. And when you're looking at those and wondering what in the... Let me ask you this. Do you think that Venezuela right now is functioning according to the norm standard of five divine institutions? No. No, no. not at all. No. See, all this is related to the resolution of the angelic conflict. It says, having, having determined their appointed times... And having determined their point in times refers to time broken down into separate ages. The age of Gentiles, age of Israel, age of grace, and age of the millennium. Now, and the boundary and the bounds of their habitation, that phrase, that phrase, and the bounds of their habitation, God the Father's plan has ordained that nations have boundaries and the bounds of their habitation. God the Father's plan is ordained that nations have boundaries. This has a contemporary application. Do you see that? What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is today we're being told in this country our boundaries on the United States don't amount to a hill of beans. Don't need them. Yep. Let them all come. Uh-huh. Interesting enough, I don't know what I said. I don't know if I mentioned this yesterday or not, but I'll mention it again today if I didn't. Or if I did, really. The Statue of Liberty, somebody posted out on Facebook a couple weeks ago, a little longer, a picture of the Statue of Liberty, and underneath that picture, they said, how many Americans actually know what the last sentence of, of that writing on the bottom of the Statue of Liberty is? It had to do with the fact that if you're going to come to, the, if you're going to, come to this nation, you're going to live according to our principles, and if you don't, just stay home. You're an enemy. You're an enemy of this nation if you don't do that, okay? At the last time I looked, you know, it's one thing for somebody to like what you said. You know, I didn't have to read it. I just see you post it. I give it a like, and it make you feel better, okay? And the more likes you have, the better you feel. See, that's where you get your happiness, the number of likes on Facebook. Well, the truth of the matter is I know what happens. You, you, everybody doesn't necessarily like it. They just... Hit it because you're a friend, and that's they go on from there. But then there's another option that is you could make a comment, or you can actually share what you have on your Facebook page. You can somebody can share it, and they'll come in and share it, and they'll put it on their timeline. I said I have about 1,500 friends right now, maybe a little more than that. 1,500 friends. And there were 2.5 thousand shares of that of that deal. I'm lucky if I can get five people to like what I put out there. But that thing got 2.5 thousand shares. That means 2,500 people shared it. <coughs> Steve, are you a mathematician? Look here. If I if every one of my if every one of my friends who shared that had a hundred friends, mm-hmm. you know me who saw that? Two hundred and fifty thousand people. Yeah, four million. Yeah. Four million. In two weeks' time. Yeah. You see it, Marshall? Mm-hmm. That's amazing. It is. It is. So these the these you hear were back to the, the boundaries the bounds of their habitation. Mm-hmm. 
God the Father's plan has ordained that nations have boundaries, and this has a contemporary application. The next thing is the thrust of Paul's court, courtroom message. What's the thrust of it? What, what kind of an impact does this have? Well, first of all, let's learn something about this. Courtrooms, I don't care where they are, courtrooms are designed for law and order. And Paul knew that. This is why I said yesterday that one of my mentors made the statement that when Paul looked out here and saw what was going on in, in, uh, in Athens, he used his head. And he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to keep this preaching up, and hopefully they'll take me to court. Because when I get to court with this unknown, with this unknown, uh, un, uh, you know, altered with an unknown God, I'm going to be able to get in there and tell them what all this is about. So here's the issue. When you get in a courtroom, you have to have law and order. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to say anything. Secondly, part is on trial in an Athenian courtroom. And the Athenian philosophers, the Stoics and the, and the Epicureans, what they were doing, they were trying to unlawfully use the courtroom against Paul. He says, okay, this is for law and order. They're taking him there and going to try to use it against him, but it backfires. So what happens is this. He gets into that courtroom, and whether, that, whether that's true or not, that Paul designed it this way, or whether it just happened, is immaterial. But the issue is he got in that courtroom, and he was able to give this message, and we saw that he wasn't politically correct. He just nailed the issues. So Paul courageously points this out that he's unlawfully being tried. This is a court that was supposed to have law and order, but I'm here and I'm going to tell you the truth. So first, some facts about the gospel. So we see that what's, what's the courtroom all about. Now let's talk about some facts about the gospel. Stop and think with me. Reason with me. Ask yourself if this doesn't make sense. The gospel requires hearing. The gospel is in the Bible. You have the gospel in your head. But you can't transfer that gospel from, your, from you to somebody else if you don't open your mouth. They're going to have to hear something. So first of all, the gospel requires hearing. Secondly, freedom is designed to provide a hearing for the gospel. We must have freedom. And that's one of the things that, that the, uh, the, 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 the deep state, the progressive left, they're trying to take our freedoms away from us. And it hasn't been within this last week that I actually uh, shared a message with you about persecution of Christians in the United States of America. It's a reality, folks, and it's progressive, okay? Thirdly, to hear gospel facts, there must be law and order in the devil's world. That's where we are. And that's one of the reasons why we have law and order in the devil's world. It's so that we have the freedom to do what we're going to do. Fourthly, the devil will do all that he can to obstruct a hearing of the gospel. And Satan is constantly trying to destroy the five divine institutions that provide opportunities to hear the gospel. Better listen to me. Listen to this. Satan is doing everything he can to destroy the five divine institutions. You, okay, let's talk about it. Freedom. Is freedom being destroyed in this country? The present administration is trying to revive it. For years and years and years, we've seen freedom being diminished. Just go back and listen to the message on Christian persecution in the United States. Okay, so freedom, it's, it's being diminished. What's the next thing? Marriage. Question. I have a question. What has happened to marriage in this country? What's happened to it? Now, let me point out something. If you're out there on Facebook, you're out here on WebEx, and you happen to be living with somebody, unmarried. That's between you and the Lord. That's between you and the Lord. 
And I'm going to suggest something to you that many people aren't going to like. But it's my considered opinion that you don't need to have a marriage license to be married. That's what you said. You don't have to have a marriage license to be married. You do as far as the government's concerned. But as far as God's concerned, find that passage for me in the scripture. But see, what happens now is by making it that way, guess who's controlling your marriage? Guess who's controlling your life? Guess who's guess who's making money every time you have to buy a marriage certificate or you have to get a counselor to get divorced or whatever? There's so much that's fouled up in this country. Fouled up in the world, not here. Fouled up in the world. Okay, so freedom and marriage, gone. How about family? Good grief. What's happened to the family? You look at it. Nationalism. Trying to destroy the nation. Free market capitalism. Down the tube. And employment. Employment's on the rise. But it was sure down pretty low years past. So the devil will do all he can to obstruct the hearing of the gospel and Satan is constantly trying to destroy the five divine institutions that provide opportunities to hear the gospel. You need to understand if I said five divine institutions, what are they? Freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, and employment. Now here are two great principles in verse 27. It says, and they, human beings, and they would seek God, the only legitimate God, and that see all the he's been he's been giving this three three tier twenty four twenty five twenty six uh, this new new plan that he's got here as, as far as he's preaching concerned and he goes on in verse twenty seven and all that is in order that they human beings would seek God seek the only legitimate God not one of these idols out here. Then the next word is if, and that word if is a fourth class condition. And a fourth class condition means I wish it were true, but it's not. So here's what he's saying. All this in verse 24, 25, and 26 is in order that they would seek God. I wish they would, but they're not. If perhaps they might grope for him, grope for the only legitimate God, and find him, the only legitimate God, though he, God, is not far from each one of us. Now stop and think what he's talking about. He's been talking about this, this idol, this altar to an unknown God. They've been worshiping these idols all over town. Here's this one right over here. And Paul said, I've been preaching Jesus and his resurrection. And whoa, look here. Here's this, here's this altar over here. I'm going to take that one and use it over here because they don't they don't understand who that is i'm going to tell them who it is it's jesus the one who's resurrected and he said and you know what you have been flailing around here in life trying to find happiness in life and he said it's just as just as near as right here just as near as right here he said to grow for him and find him Though he is not far from each one of us. There are two great principles underlying this verse 27, whereby all members of the human race are given, listen, all members of the human race are given a grace opportunity to become saved. A grace opportunity. That means a provision of God. We're going to have to do it his way and not your way. So principle number one, these two principles come out of this verse. First of all, God consciousness. Point one, all normal members of the human race. Now, by a, uh, by a normal member, you're going to look at me and say, ain't nobody normal. Okay? What this means here is someone who is physically handicapped to the point where they cannot reason. They cannot think. That's right. It's a mental handicap. Otherwise, normal people can. This has nothing to do with a low IQ. As long as you can think and reason to some degree, you have the capacity 
to be God conscious. So all normal human beings of the human race reach, they do, they reach the point of God consciousness. They do. Yes, they do. And when they do, volition, positive and negative, becomes the issue. So what happens is you have volition. You have freedom. Volition with a positive pole, you can do the right thing. Negative pole, you can do the wrong thing. You can make a good decision, a bad decision. So the, when a member of the human race becomes aware of the fact that God exists, then volition comes into the issue. And the question is, do you want to know more about him or do you not? I want to know more about him. That's positive volition. I don't want to know any more about him. I'm satisfied. I see these altars over here and they'll pick me out of God and worship that one. That's negative volition. So you have a choice. There are two, the, listen, the two most important choices in your life. Not four, not three, two. What are you going to do at the point of God consciousness? Secondly, what are you going to do when God presents the gospel to you? Two important decisions. The two most important decisions in life. Point number two, if a person manifests negative volition when they're at the point of God consciousness, God the Father has no further responsibility toward that individual. None. Point three, if a person manifests positive volition at the point of God consciousness, God the Father is responsible for providing the gospel information for that person. Someone says, well, wait a minute. I live on a remote island out in the Aegean Sea. Uh, uh, let me, uh, who do you think knows that? <laughs> God knows that. And he'll either get the missionary to you or the gospel to you. Doesn't have to be a missionary. It's you. Uh, you say, honey, let's go. Honey, I'll tell you what, let's do. Let's go on a vacation. He says, where do you want to go? I said, well, I saw something about an, uh, an island out in the, in the Aegean Sea. I'd just love to go over there one time. How about going? Say, oh, yeah, I'd love to go with you. So you pack your bags and you, you get over to the Aegean Sea. And you, there's somebody on this island waiting for you. Now, you understand? Yeah. I, yeah. I find a note in the bottle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> note in the bottle. Yeah, sure enough. Well, the Hallmark movies re recently had something like that. So here again, if you manifest positive relation, God's responsible to get you the gospel. Now, point number two. So God consciousness is the first principle in this verse 27. The next one is gospel hearing. Positive relation at gospel hearing expresses itself by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So here it is. You're God conscious. The, the gospel has now been presented to you. And when you're hearing the gospel, it is faith. It is faith that expresses itself toward the Lord Jesus Christ, and that brings you salvation. Now, principle number one and principle number two are the issue then in verse 27. When you go back and read verse 27 again, what Paul's talking about is the importance of God consciousness and the importance of gospel hearing. Now, let's look at the, let's look at the logical progression of this, because, see, God has a plan. And his plan needs to be executed in the proper manner. God is not the author of confusion. K-R-R-Y. It's not Y-R-K-R. -R. It's not K-Y-R-R. -R. It's not R-R-K-Y. It's K-R-R-Y. God consciousness and gospel hearing. You don't the, the gospel the gospel presented to anybody before they are God conscious is worthless. Therefore, you have to be God conscious first. See, that's the order. Logical progression. There is a logical progression in God's established order for the purpose of evangelizing the human race. First, God consciousness. Second, gospel hearing. Now, in the amazing, now listen. We were talking up above there about the about the five divine institutions and about how Satan's desire is one of his desires is to destroy the five divine institutions. Do you realize how important the family is for evangelizing your children so that by the time they they reach six, eight, ten, twelve years of age, they are founded in 
the word of God. But when the family is destroyed, guess what? Whether they get the gospel or not is, is a toss-up. Verse 27, the phrase that they would seek God. Seeking God is the manifestation of positive religion. Get that. He, he provides, he provides the, the boundaries. He provides five divine institutions so that you can evangelize, so that you will hear the gospel and actually get saved. So the idea of all this, Paul's message, is that they would seek God. And seeking God, when you seek God, it's not just, I go to church. Oh, really? What do you get out of it? Well, I don't know. Just go to church. Oh, it's fun. I, 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 I have a lot of fellowship. No, you see, we need to be seeking God. That's why you're on the line with me tonight. That's why you're in this room tonight. That's why you're on, on, on WebEx with me tonight. You're seeking God. You have a desire. Listen, if you weren't seeking God, there's no reason why you need to be here. So it's, it's important they do that. So at the point of God consciousness, mankind is only aware of the existence of God. Listen at the point of God consciousness, hey, there's a God out there. Well, what do you know about the word of God? What do you know about the gospel? I don't know. Is there one? See, at the point of God consciousness, mankind is only aware of the existence of God. Let me point something out to you. Generally speaking, a, a child reaches the point of God consciousness at a very early age. If it's no more than mother is saying to him, let us pray. Pray, what, what's praying? Well, there's a God out there. The child is aware of the fact there's a God out there. So you don't have to be 80 years old. Generally speaking, God consciousness takes place very, very early in life. So at the point of God consciousness, mankind is only aware of the fact of the existence of God. However, that person doesn't have any information whereby salvation might be achieved. I'm aware of there's God out there, but what, goes, what do we do from here? God consciousness merely means to be aware of God's existence, and it stops right there. God consciousness never implies knowing anything about the gospel. Now, there are two points of grace. Number one, man can become aware of the existence of God by his own mental ability, but man can go no further with it. Romans chapter 1 says, look, all you have to do is open your eyes. He said, you can know who I am. You can know my very attributes by the things that are made. Wow, look out here. Where did that come from? There must be a God out there somewhere. See, now you're God conscious. Secondly, the gospel has to be, has to be, it should be B. Put that word in. The gospel has to be revealed. It has to be revealed. So here's the issue. If you're aware there's a God and there's no gospel, of what value is there? Is it to know that there's a God out there? So the gospel has to be revealed. Then guess what? Now that it's revealed, where is it? It's revealed in the Bible. But you, so what now? You're, you are, you're, uh, you're conscious that God exists. And back there in that book over there in the corner, the, the gospel is revealed over there. Well, of what value is it to the guy who is positive the point of God consciousness if it's hidden back there in the book? So first of all, God consciousness, then the word of God, has, the gospel has to be revealed, and then it has to be communicated. And once it's communicated, guess what? It has to be heard. And verse 27 is it? And find him and find God. What does it mean to find God? This refers to the point of gospel hearing. When you hear the gospel and you trust Christ, faith alone in him, guess what? You have just found God. He hadn't been hiding from you. Though he, God, is not far from each one of us, each one of whom? Human beings, no matter where you are. And the principle is this. God is near. God is as near as man's what? positive volition. Up until, up until positive volition, he's out there somewhere. I don't know where he is. But when you hear the gospel, positive volition toward the gospel, bingo, there he is. He's as near as man's positive volition. In, in verse 28, Paul's going to explain something about the existence of God. 
He says, for, for in him, God, we human beings live and move and, and exist. Listen to that. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said. Now Paul is going to take one of their poets and quote a poem to them. One of, the, one of their, their philosophical poets. And he says, quote, For we, are all, we also are God's children. Listen to that. This, this poet was actually saying he realized that we human beings are God's children. Now, you said something a little while ago about that. We, yeah. it's, what does that mean, we're God's children? That doesn't mean we're on his team. It doesn't mean we're saved. But that means that we recognize we came from him. He is the author of all this. He created man, and we come from Adam. We belong to him. We're, a, that, we're his children actually means we're part of the human race. Then in verse 20, it says, for we live in him. This refers, this refers to soul life. We live in him. There's your soul. That's the real you. And what do we do? We live and we move. This refers to functioning, fulfilling the functions of life. I eat, I drink, I go to the bathroom, I do this, do that. And we exist. So we live in him, refers to our soul life. We move, that's function in life, and we exist. Meaning, hey, we recognize we are. Now Paul quotes the, sto quotes the Stoic part of poet when he says, as certain as also of your poets have said, as certain also of your poets have said. That's the Stoic poet. The poem indicates that Stoics recognized the fact that God made man and that man did not make God. Secondly, Paul used the Stoics' own uh, literature to prove to them that their basic beliefs at that time were inconsistent with their own philosophical system. Without realizing it, Stoic writers not only recognized that God existed before man existed, but at the same time they recognized that every idol in the city of Athens was ridiculous. For we also are his children. They recognized this. Poets recognized that God made us and we didn't make God. Then Paul summarizes this. In verse 20, 29, human beings being the children of God, human beings being the children of God by creation, that's it. We're not in his family. We're children of God in the sense that we, we are a part of the human race. We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold and silver or stone. So in other words, okay, we got this, we got this God out there somewhere. Uh, let's create him. Let's make him into a, let's make a, a pillar here. Let's uh, make an altar to him. We ought not think that divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the, by the art and thought of man. So being then children of God, again, Paul is implying that man was created by God. God is not a, a, God is not a creation of man. In verse 30, Paul now says and states his conclusion. And here's the conclusion that Paul makes. Therefore, God the Father, have, watch it, God the Father having overlooked the times of ignorance. See, Paul already told him, you are ignorant. You're, you're, worship, you're ignorant and worshiping this idol out here. And Paul's telling him here, God having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to man that all people everywhere should repent. She said, look here, God knows you're, you're ignorant. You know now you're ignorant. What are you going to do about that? He said the issue is to repent. Change your mind about Jesus. Therefore, having overlooked, now look at the little diagram there. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, this refers to a succession of events between God consciousness on the left. <clears throat> in that diagram, there's an X on the left-hand side. That's the point in life when you became God conscious. <clears throat> Between that time and gospel hearing, here you are out there worshiping all kinds of idols. You're trying to seek, seek happiness in pleasure. You're trying to seek happiness in some kind of irrationale, your thought processes out here. And every one of those are a manifestation of negative volition. But what Paul's telling them, you, you, you came to know God existed right there, and it took you all this time to get out here to become, uh, hear the gospel and believe, 
But in between that, here are all these manifestations of ignorance. Ignorance, And some of us might say something like this. Look, how's God going to handle this? I have been ignorant. I've been blowing this thing for years and years and years. Paul says, excuse me, therefore having overlooked the times of ignorance. This refers to the succession of events between God consciousness and gospel hearing. It is the time in which God, and between, it is the time in which man displays his ignorance to the gospel of Christ. And what's it say? God overlooked it. He overlooked it. But now God is declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. Change your mind. Now it's it's time to finish. We got uh, uh, three or four more verses here, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick them up on on Wednesday night, Steve, and we're going into chapter 18. These four verses plus chapter 18. So. Thank all who are online with me tonight. The notes are in my Dropbox if you don't have them. Thank all of you who are online with me over here on Facebook. Uh, I'll have this up on YouTube here just shortly. Go ahead and pray for us, Steve. Well, this is an awesome study. We look back to Apostle Paul who took the opportunity to get out of the four walls, as we say, out of yes. the marketplace where the people were and seize a yeah. unique opportunity to bring the gospel to them. We should take a note from this, and Father, as we go out the, today... Yes. This time in our life, we should go into our sphere of influence and use the opportunity to seize to teach the gospel to those, share the gospel with those who, who are in our realm of, of influence. Because these decisions they make about God conscious, about what to do about it, are eternal consequences. And they are a living soul that's going to spend somewhere mm. in eternity. And Father, we could yes. be that person that leads them to Christ. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Folks, folks on, on Facebook and WebEx. Look beyond your past. Look beyond your past. The future is bright. Okay? God bless all of you.